You're listening to episode 84 of the D6 Podcast. Here's the encouragement I give you. The shortest distance between your child's heart, your grown child's heart, and Christ is you. Parents need to own that they are the primary disciples of their child. Our goal in parenting is not for our kids ultimately to get a great education, as good as that is. Our goal is not for them to be great athletes. Our goal is not for them to go on great dates and have, find a great husband or a great wife. Our goal is not for them to have a great career with a great job, making great money. Our goal is for them to love a great God. A great God, a great God. A great You're great listening God. to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the family ministry podcast that helps you connect the church and home. And I hope sometime soon somebody's going to connect some food to my mouth because I'm hungry today, Ron. How are you? I I am getting there myself. We're ju- that's what happens when we talk about these things just before we come on the air, isn't it? Yes, right. <laughs> Maybe we should share with the listeners where we're thinking about going to eat, but I don't think that would be nice. But if you listen to this transition, I'm being I'm about to be super cheesy. But if you're hungry for teaching tips, oh, no, I have an no, interview no. for you today. I was thinking cheeseburger. Oh no, this <laughs> I was trying to transition and uh, didn't work. But we're gonna roll. Hey, Ken Coley is this super smart guy. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know him before I interviewed him. Uh, and uh, I love, I, th- I say this a lot, when they sit down and they have a gentle presence and ton of wisdom, and that's who this guy was. Did not try to impress or be over the top and and just nugget after nugget after nugget. Like stuff that you, when you listen to this interview, there'll be stuff you guys can use this week in your lesson. There is. You know, Ken has been at this so many years, and he has mentored so many uh, student pastors and quite honestly, seminary students at Southeastern He doesn't have to brag. I mean, he's just absolutely gone out and done it. Uh, He gets a chance to work with people on dissertations, work with people on research. Uh, He is, he's like a walking library, but yet he doesn't come across on that real strong academic side because he sounds so practical when he talks. That's right. Uh, But he's, he's going to be talking to us about teaching his teenager and, and reaching that teenage mind. And that's the book that he's written recently to help teachers absolutely think about their teaching approaches and what it looks like in the classroom in a much more effective way. Yeah, let me tell you guys how I set up this interview just so you understand the value you're about to get. What I did was I found online him teaching a seminar that somebody probably paid him thousands of dollars to come to their church to do. And I basically went through that whole seminar. It took about three hours of my life, but it was well worth it because I went through that whole seminar and I basically had him reteach it to us in this interview. So here's what I'm trying to say to you people listening. I'm about to give you thousands of dollars worth of teacher training help so please enjoy. Now, we also, he's not all we have today. No. We've got more, 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 more. Absolutely. Mr. John Stone Street, great name. Yes, John. <laughs> that's one that you, what what kind of door would that be on, Jeremy? <laughs> Stone Street. Would that be I mean, on an attorney's door, uh, an architectural you know, firm? Well, the way I evaluate a good name is I always pretend I'm the color commentator at a football game, and I say, Stone Street on the tackle. And <laughs> if that sounds cool, then I know it's an awesome name. Because I don't have the voice you have. I've never done that a day in my life. (laughs) So John Stone Street is from the Chuck Colson Center, and he talks about worldviews. And uh, without a doubt, worldview has the ability to interpret or engage culture. And our culture affects how we think, how we act, uh, the attitudes in which we have. And if anything is important to us as parents and grandparents is helping our kids navigate our culture because our culture constantly changes. And if we're not careful, the culture will change us. Perfect. That is exactly why you should hang with us all the way through this break. And let's start this process today of having an awesome podcast. We'll see you soon. Do you ever feel as if you spend so much time doing the work of the ministry that you never actually minister to people? Wouldn't it be great if you had a little help with your ministry to-do list? What if you already had two training emails for your volunteers each month along with a fully produced video that drove the point home? What if you were able to share nearly every main stage talk that has ever happened at the D6 conference with your ministry team? Imagine having a ministry coach pour into you personally each month. What if we gave you a resource that you could give to parents in your ministry to have tough conversations around life's difficult topics? 
This is the kind of stuff they can really use and they'll be grateful to receive. When you become a member of the D6LN, we immediately make your life easier. We help you with your weekly event, teacher training, family ministry, parent helps, and your own personal ministry helps. The D6 Leader Network is going to give you content, coaching, and community throughout the entire year. The D6 Leader Network makes awesome easy. Just go to d6leader.net to give it a try today. Well, our guest today is Dr. Ken Coley. Thank you for being here, sir. Absolutely. I'm telling you, in preparation for this interview, I told you I watched one of your seminars. And if you guys uh, have any kind of volunteers in your ministry, uh, I, I would say kids or youth, we've got somebody here who can help you learn how to train them yourself or just bring them on in and have him train them because... It is uh, good stuff. Dr. Ken Coley has taught master's and doctoral level classes in educational leadership at Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Currently, he's the director of the Doctor of Education program. He's had three books on leadership and school administration. Uh, the Helmsman, did I do that right? Yes. Uh, leading with Courage and Wisdom and Navigating the Storms, Leading Christian Schools with Character and Conviction, and a new release, 10 Practices of Effective Boards, a unique tale about board governance. But there's another. There's more. Yes. Uh, we've got Teaching for Change, Eight Keys for Transformational Bible Study with Teens. And that's a lot about what we're going to be talking about today, Teaching the Teenage Mind. Yes. Does that sound good? Are you ready? Absolutely. I love it. All right. So you've spent a large amount of time studying how the teenage brain learns. And we've got youth ministers listening to this. We've got children's ministers who have older kids in their ministry that need to help prepare families for the teenage years, correct? So what would you give us some nuggets that we can use as we try to teach teenagers the Bible, which is not the easiest task, right? Yes, yes. Uh, there is very good news, and then there's some challenges. Uh, first, the good news uh, during the teen years, it's a key time for brain plasticity, and that's a mouthful, but the idea is the brain is changing and growing, and the way God designed our mental development is an opportunity for uh, great growth cognitively, and so with this idea of brain plasticity, uh, teenagers can learn very efficiently and they can learn very quickly and great news to report uh, from the time that I grew up we were thinking that once you had an IQ score you were pretty much locked in uh, current research mind brain and education research that has been debunked. Oh, That's wow. just not the case. I didn't know that. Uh, but we have some challenges. Uh, the connectivity uh, between all the areas of the brain are still in process. In the frontal lobe, there's what's called the executive function. That's the area of the brain where uh, quick decisions are, are made. So <laughs> That's not good for teenagers. <laughs> well, it's just not uh, completely connected yet. Mm. So no sarcastic humor about bring, being brain dead. It's just a developmental process. That's why we don't give a driver's license to 14-year-olds. Mm. Roll into an intersection and have to make split-second decisions. It's very tough. Mm. So that's a very important challenge during the teen years is to develop that processing but not be overloaded and placed in positions like peer pressure for illegal drugs, uh, peer pressure for going to websites uh, that are going to be a negative experience because the executive function uh, is not fully connected yet. Uh, sometimes those uh, split-second decisions are not good. And then there's a third area, and that is hormones. Uh, dump in the chemicals with all on this all on all this going on, mm. and you have some uh, emotional swings, highs and lows, and we all remember uh, what that's like. And so that creates real uh, vulnerability uh, for uh, different types of addictions. 
uh, during this time period. So that's a few things that's going yeah. on in our kids' heads. Oh, that's good. You're doing great off the gate. Way to go, man. <laughs> All right. So you taught a seminar called Five Myths That Are Strangling Your Teaching. I do not want to have strangled teaching, and I bet <laughs> the people listening don't want to either. I love that title. Could you give us just a few of those, maybe some of the best ones might that we might could, uh, because we don't want strangled teaching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of our Bible teachers are just teaching from an old playbook, uh, and that creates uh, some uh, really disappointing lesson plans and delivery. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the myths in this uh, in this playbook. One myth is our kids come with Velcro. Well, guess what? There is no Velcro in their brains. Just because you toss it out doesn't mean they're going to catch it. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, and so uh, all the current research is saying they must be engaged. That is, engaged for change. They must be engaged in order to construct their understanding. So they take new information and construct it and connect it to prior learning and prior experience. Mm. Here's another myth. Uh, if I can get them all quiet and they sit passively and they listen to me, then they're learning. Well, uh, one author calls, uh, calls this civil attention. Mm. Uh, nice. Kids have been trained how, and they've been disciplined how to sit still and stare and nod and chuckle on cue. But in fact, after eight to 10 minutes, they've checked out. Their bodies are uh, polite. Their facial expressions are, are polite, but their minds just aren't there. And so <clears throat> this is, um, it's creating situations where kids go to Bible study for 40, 50 minutes and the next day, they're not prepared to do anything. No change is taking place. Mm. That's good. Okay, so you, you taught a session where you talked about two verses that matter. It was First Thessalonians 2.13 <coughs> and Colossians 1.28 and 29. So I would just wonder, why are these verses important to teachers? Sure. Uh, everybody has uh, favorite scriptures that if they're a little down or a little tired, uh, they, they can uh, meditate on or think about the scripture and get some fired up. Every time I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, I think of Paul writing back to the Thessalonians, and he says, you received what we said, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which is doing its work in you who believe. Well, the, the title of the book has the word transformation. And right there in this, in this verse, Paul's talking about, he recognizes God's words transforming them uh, when he says it's doing its work. Uh, Greek word energian gives us our English word energy, just like energizer bunny. Mm. And so um, it's, it's thrilling to know uh, that our kids can receive God's word and it brings about the change. Well, mm. the second passage that you mentioned, uh, Colossians, uh, Paul says in 128, I want to present everyone as mature, as perfect in Christ. And we all take a step back and go, wow, that's a heavy burden. That's, that's quite a goal. And so we, we sort of shrink back. Well, uh, we couple uh, what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians with what he says here, and we're just reminded that it's God's Word that's doing the changing. And then in Colossians 1, 29, he follows up that big statement about presenting everyone uh, perfect or mature in Christ with, uh, I do so because your spirit is working powerfully through me. I strive because your spirit is working uh, through me. Mm. And so that gives us all great comfort and courage um, and 
we can relax knowing that the Holy Spirit is going to be working through us and the Holy Spirit's going to bring about the change. Mm. We can't do it. And so we, would, we shouldn't think that it's uh, all on us because it's not. Man, you just uh, laid out the next volunteer training seminar uh, for all the ministers listening. Y'all could just rewind what he just said. Let's do it. Put your own spin on it, and there you go. I mean, that, thank you for that. That was amazing. And you've got another little thing I saw in your seminar that I wanted to share. It's just a little trick that you used that I'm assuming you use with kids too, but you used it with the, with the adults in the crowd where you, um, it was, you were talking about active learning techniques and, it was, uh, and you gave an example and you gave everybody green, yellow, and red note cards. Could you explain how you use that? Sure. Because I think people want to steal that idea. Too. Yeah, sure. In uh, educational parlance, it's called formative assessment. So you do an evaluation or an assessment while the educational process is still being formed. It's still in process. So if you think about it in school, uh, you give them short little bursts of quizzes that aren't graded so uh, everybody can find out how they're doing and the teacher can change uh, his or her approach and the students can change. Well, in the case of our Bible study, we're not giving quizzes and we're certainly not giving exams, but the exam is the next day Mm. in the locker room, on the bus, in the community, in the cafeteria, that's when the exam takes place. And unfortunately, uh, all too often, our kids are flunking the exam because there was no formative assessment going on during the Bible study. Hmm. So let's look at red, yellow, and green, just like a stoplight. Uh, Red means, hey, I gotta stop and really pay attention here because I don't get this. Uh, Yellow, uh, I have somewhat of an idea of what's going on here, but I'm going to proceed slowly. Uh, If if your idea of yellow stoplight means speed up, well, (laughs) you're you're missing the point here. Okay. And then uh, green means I got this. Accelerate. Let's go. Mm. So uh, you can distribute a red, yellow, green note card. And as you teach, notes can be made on uh, each of these cards representing the student's level of comprehension. Uh, Certainly another approach is you can stop after 10 or 15 minutes of a lecture style presentation. Now go back and take a look at your notes or take a look at the verses and just jot the number of the verse on the note card. That represents your level of understanding. And then you can ask two or three questions and ask them to simply wave the color of the note card that represents Mm -hmm. their level of comprehension. A totally different approach, get pink, yellow, green highlighters from local office supply store and make those available. And the kids highlight their notes. I got this. You highlight it in green. Not too sure. Highlight it in yellow man, I got to stop and work on this because I have no clue what uh, Paul means by propitiation. I love that. (laughs) Good job. All right. So I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about this book. Okay. So talk to me about Teaching for Change and how a ministry can utilize this book. Uh, I designed this book uh, after 40 plus years of teaching. I wanted to take all the things Uh, that have really been valuable in my career, Uh, take all the current research that I've been doing and the things that I'm passionate about and do it in just over 100 pages and do it in such a way that the average layperson that loves the Lord, uh, that loves the kids, but not too sure they're very good at teaching, they can pick up a book and they can read it. Well, uh, beyond this... Uh, if the director of the ministry would first get the book and digest it and then get a copy of the book for everybody in the group and then have some uh, brief sessions and do a chapter or two at a time. I create a fictitious character. His name is Nathan. 
uh, my apologies to all the listeners <laughs> whose name is Nathan. And Nathan at the beginning has got all the love for kids and scripture and for the Lord, but he doesn't know spit about teaching and he admits it. Mm. And we walk him through eight chapters and he becomes a transformational teacher. Mm. And as you said at the top, if you want to have uh, a get together and invite me in, certainly I'd be delighted to uh, do the coaching. But the book is set up, uh, could be read individually as a group. It's got questions. It's uh, really usable. Wow, you can buy them for your volunteers. I love it. Yep. Okay, so if you want to learn more about Ken Coley, and more specifically, learn how you can bring him to your church to train your teachers, you can go to Ken Coley, C-O-L-E-Y dot WordPress dot com. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. We've all been there. Your buddy sent you this can't-miss icebreaker idea. It even involves a tiny bit of pyrotechnics, he said. It sounded great, but the next day, as you stare at the empty places your eyebrows used to be, you think, hey, there has to be a better way to get their attention that doesn't involve so many fire trucks. Is this you? If it is, I'm John Forrest, and I'm here to help. I've written Help! My Games Think. It's 52 engaging ideas that will get the students' attention without burning the church down. Check it out at the store at d6family.com. And Jeremy was right, man. I'm, oh, I think thousand dollars might be underestimating that. That's right. Thanks. You you always ask such good questions. Just that whole. I made sure. I don't even think he wanted to give us because it was one of his <laughs> tricks. But that green card, red card trick mm. that he offers there, I made sure that I slipped that in for you guys because that's something that you can oh, do yeah. this week. And uh, it's really clever. And uh, that might have been one of his sugar sticks. I don't think he wanted to give, but I, I made him give it anyway. So good job, serving Jeremy. my audience. Good job, Jeremy. <laughs> well, let's jump into John Stone Street here. And uh, we want to acknowledge that we struggle within culture. And culture establishes normal. And that's what John Stone Street is going to talk to us about is how do we affect the normal in our lives in a way that God calls us to be salt and light? Uh, well, then let's listen to John Stone Street. Sitting here with John Stone Street, the president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and he's the co-host of Breakpoint. I'm impressed with your ministry. I've been impressed reading your book, John. The title of the book is A Practical Guide to Culture. The subtitle is Helping the Next Generation Navigate Today's World. It's written by John Stone Street and Brett Kunkel. What a great book here. I've, I've dove into this book. John, you've done an excellent job. What I'd like to do is ask you, in the beginning of the book, you talk about what culture does to us. Explore that a little bit. And I've got a follow-up question I'd like to spend most of our time on, but tell us what culture does to us. You know, culture is one of the most used, least defined words, I think, in the kind of the Christian world, especially for parents or youth pastors or whatever. We talk about the culture. Usually we mean in terms of we've got to be relevant to the culture in our ministry or we mean the culture as all the bad stuff that happens in the world. And so we, we thought before we start talking about the culture, and certainly today the culture is a pain point. For, for anyone concerned about the next generation, You're talking about addiction, sexuality, pornography, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. we got to understand both what culture is and what are Christians called to uh, when it comes to culture. And uh, a big part of that is your question, which is what culture does to us. Here's what culture does to us. Uh, culture cr is, is the world uh, that we make of the world. So when people get together, they make environments and they make environments. That's what, that's what culture is, the environment we make out of our ideas and our institutions and our structures and our artifacts, you know, things like, like that. And the power of that culture is that it becomes what's normal for us. So the most powerful thing that culture does is make things seem normal. Culture is at its most powerful, not where it's it's at its loudest, but where it's at its, uh, you know, where, where it takes things for granted. C.S. Lewis said the most dangerous ideas in a society aren't the ones argued, but the ones assumed, the ones that are just embedded uh, in, in our life. And that's what culture does to us. It shapes us. It convinces us that certain ideas, certain habits, certain practices are normal. 
That's awesome. I think that's absolutely well said. When when we think about things that are normal, we'd have to go back a generation. If, if anybody travels by air today, uh, they know that we have a new normal in, in world travel. Uh, we can't right. just walk to the gate anymore. We can't just say certain things out loud in an airport anymore. There's a new normal. And you're right, it is assumed. Uh, so let, let me go a step further. When there's a new normal and it's not a healthy Christian normal, how then do Christians struggle within that normal? Well, in one of two ways. I mean, one, then the, the world becomes a place to be avoided. When I was growing up, that's kind of how uh, we were taught about culture is that culture is the thing to stay away from. Uh, but listen, the capacity that humans have to make culture is a gift of God. So if we're hiding and running from culture, we're not fulfilling our mandate. What's, you know, whether you, I think both the cultural mandate that we get in Genesis 1 and the way that God created humans and the role that he gave them on the planet uh, to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, but also the Great Commission teaching, uh, you know, that Christ has authority in all areas. So either way, if we're avoiding the culture, we're not fulfilling our mandate. Uh, that, you know, what we're supposed to do. On the other hand, the temptation when it's normal is to go unthinkingly and embrace, uh, you know, the ideas and the habits of culture. I mean, there's, when you use the word new normal, I mean, I think that's really why Brett and I wrote the book is that there's a new normal and we're feeling like things that were a generation ago considered unthinkable are now considered unquestionable and vice versa. There's been a dramatic shift in the new normal when it comes to areas of sexuality, the amount of information that we all have to deal with, the number of glowing screens that are constantly clamoring for our attention, uh, pornography, the addiction, uh, uh, the addiction epidemic. And so all of these are kind of the new normal that we deal with in the book. So when, when we have all of these influences in our culture, you, you said, and I want to follow up here, you said Christians either avoid it or embrace it. Is there another right. direction that you, you see them going? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the right direction is uh, to understand it and engage it, right? Understanding that culture matters because ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. So if I'm going to love my neighbor, uh, whether that's my son, whether that's the kid in my youth group or my actual lost, you know, pagan neighbor, then I need to not only care about them, I need to care about the cultural forces that are shaping their lives, uh, and so just understanding culture is a big step forward uh, for, uh, for, for, for Christians. It's just that we can make sense of what's underneath it, the undercurrents uh, that are shaping the, the realities that we experience day in and day out. Okay, so help us make sense of one of the cultural forces. Name three or four cultural forces, the top ones you see influencing us, but then camp out on one and help us make sense from how we should engage that from a Christian perspective, John. Yeah. So the majority of the book deals with with cultural uh, things, uh, you know, the incidents or the events or the issues that we face. Some of them are very uh, obvious. Uh, these are the, what we call the cultural waves. If you stood on the so- seashore and got hit by a wave, you knew it. And we felt like we've gotten hit by waves, right, particularly when it comes to, I think, sexuality in our culture. But there's also the undercurrent. So we've been in the ocean, look up, find ourselves 20 yards away from our towel. How did that happen? Uh, we didn't get hit by a wave. We got taken by an undercurrent. Uh, we identify four big undercurrents. These are creating the waves that we're feeling. The first one is the reality of, of, of information. To live in the information age is to live in a culture that prizes information over wisdom, uh, and, and it really creates a challenge of discernment. Uh, a second cultural undercurrent that we face is um, perpetual adolescence. Uh, this is uh, adolescence is a relatively new phenomenon in world history. Most cultures went from being kids to being adults. Now we go to being kids to being adolescents to being adults. And adolescence isn't going away. Kids are now staying adolescent until they're 30. There's a phrase for that called failure to launch. Um, the, uh, the, yeah. the another reality is just being uh, having so much technology. Thomas Friedman's written about this and the mm-hmm. world is flat. Every youth group knows what that's like to deal with kids that are constantly looking at glowing screens. Every parent knows about this. We struggle with it ourselves. Uh, But that not only is uh, an addiction, it changes how we relate to each other. So we've got to wrestle deeply with what it means to love our neighbor when we're not looking at our neighbor in the eye. And then finally is the identity issue. And that's the one that I'll camp in on. Uh, 
many parents and youth pastors see what's happened in the culture as primarily a moral slide, that things that were once considered wrong are now considered right and vice versa. In reality, what's taken place is that the moral slide is the result of an anthropological shift. What I mean is the shift in what we think is right and wrong is the fruit, not the root. The root is now we now think human beings are primarily sexual creatures. We call it in the book identity after Christianity, that when you lose sight of God, Psalm 135 says, Mm -hmm. the, the net result of that is you lose sight of yourself. You no longer know what it means to be human. So we have a culture right now that wants to claim things like dignity and rights, but it's untethered from any kind of uh, sense that we are a special creation of God. Mm -hmm. So the most significant thing uh, that parents and youth pastors can do to help kids behave well in the world is to help them understand that they're first and foremost made in the image of God. In a culture that from the very beginning tells them the most significant thing about them are their sexual inclinations and choices. And you really have a collision here between sex and religion when it comes to business when it comes to law, but you've got a collision between sex and religion when it comes to what it means to be human. And I'm not sure there's a more important undercurrent that we've seen in our lifetime. Well stated, well stated. So what's the takeaway? What, what give our, our parents listening, and I'm gonna tell you, our ministry listeners out there, most of them are parents. What should they be aware of as their kids are coming through kindergarten, first, second grade, third grade? I mean, this happens early on. Give them some practical things to be aware of. Take take a minute, minute and a half, two minutes, and just give them some transferable. Here's here's some things you need to be aware of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think right off the bat, we need to help them understand that the most true thing about the world is not what they see in the culture; it's what they read in the scripture. And that means teaching the scripture has to be in the form of the grand narrative, not just what Philip Yancey called moral McNuggets. So instead of kind of seeing, okay, let's take this verse and apply it to our life and this verse and apply it to our life, kids need the framework that the scripture offers, that framework from creation to new creation. Part of that framework is the identity one. You know, if you talk about addiction, you talk about sexual orientation, gender identity, you talk about consumerism, you know, worshiping money and trying to fill, you know, the hole in our heart with stuff instead of God. All of it, you talk about adolescence, all of these things are identity issues. So reflecting and, 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 and making sure that the first thing they hear about who they are and the thing they hear over and over and over again is that they're made in the image and likeness of God and then unlocking what that means. So they have a place in the creative story. They have a place in God's redemptive story. When God saves them in Christ, he doesn't save them to be less human. He saves them to be fully human again. And this sort of language and articulating that and framing it out, giving them that frame of reference is the most practical thing we can do Mm. because they're not just getting bad beliefs from culture. They're getting a bad worldview, a bad frame of reference, and we've got to counter it on that same level. Mm. Wow. This, this, I, I wish parents knew how to do this at that earliest age. So I, I trust that uh, people are going to dive into your book and I want to read uh, the three, uh, you actually have four parts to your book, and there are a number of chapters beneath each one of them so that people know they can dive in a little bit further. Again, we're listening to John Stone Street, co-author of A Practical Guide to Culture, Helping the Next Generation Navigate Today's World. Part one of his book is Why Culture Matters. Part two, A Read of the Cultural Waters. Part three, Pounding Cultural Waves. Part four, The Christian Worldview Essentials. And if we are overwhelmed by the problems in culture that we see today and concerned, you need to dive through the first three parts of this, but do not escape part four that John writes about here on reading the Bible, trusting the Bible, uh, that gospel-centered culture. Uh, he, he really brings us to light in a wonderful way. And as parents, I think the most important item we can do is help our kids navigate this. If our kids came down with a disease, if our kids were, were diagnosed with any item, you would absolutely go out there on the internet and you'd study it and you'd become an expert. I'm telling you right now, our kids are suffering from culture. And if you want to dive into a book that's going to help you with it, John Stone Street's the one to turn to. And I, I trust that all of our listeners will go out there and get that. John, thank you for sharing today. This is beautiful. I wished we had 30 minutes. Maybe we'll come back and expand this on a later edition so that you can go a lot further. Well, I appreciate that. If there's, uh, and I'd love to do that. Thanks so much for the support of the book. Turning our kids loose in culture without us is not an option. 
Very well said. Thanks, John. Our thanks go to Mr. John Stone Street. Still love that name. Mm-hmm. And I uh, love that interview. Thank you so much. Now, let's talk about next week. We have a big one coming up for you. This is the – let's talk about – while we're talking about names, how about this for the name of a speaker? It might be the coolest one ever. Her name is Christy. Christy. One of one of the Christies is yes. with a K, and one of them is with a C. Christy That's Christie. right. So we we are we're having some some fun times, and uh, then we're going to be dealing with Alex, and he is the national spokesperson for Operation Christmas Child, and he has a story that you will not forget. I didn't catch Alex's last name, Ron. What was that? Oh, I am going to be kind and work on that before next week. <laughs> All right. This is like when you're listening to a football game and uh, the player has this really long name on the back of the jersey, and you're just not even ready. You don't want to hurt his feelings yet, do you? You're ready. That's right. I, I do know this. The N in his name is silent. And so I believe his last name is Sinjamana. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to Google that and we'll we be are. ready for next week. We are. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and listen to how he pronounced it before we get to next week. How about that? <laughs> we'll see you guys next Tuesday. We'll be working on our phonetics while we are uh, thinking about our guest. And we will be ready for you then. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. And if you're a minister, we invite you to join the D6 Leader Network by going to d6leadernetwork.com. 